Well, hello, Abby Vineyard. My name is Mike Laboon, and I am so honored to be able to talk to you today. Um, I'm, um, uh, I'm speaking here from a coffee shop. I'll get into why that is in just a moment. But a little bit about my background. I was a pastor along with my wife for 15 years at Winnipeg Center Vineyard, living presently in Kelowna right now, and um, super happy to be here. Um, as amidst all of the craziness that's going on right now, or as we often hear it called, this difficult time. And um, I have what will be maybe good news for you for some and bad news for you for others. I am going to talk about this difficult time. I'm going to talk about COVID and, uh, and the Bible. That's basically what I'm going to do here today. Um, a little bit of background on that, though, because already some of you may be sort of wondering what that would be like. Um, I am not going to be telling you um, that I know or that the Bible can tell us or that the Bible is designed to tell us uh, exactly when COVID will end or anything like that. Instead, I believe that the Bible is designed to tell us about the story between God and man, um, particularly from the Jewish people and then the Christian perspective um, and, uh, and going from there. So um, that is what I will talk about. And I will talk about uh, the exile, as a matter of fact, and kind of note some of the interesting parallels between our time and the exile. I don't know what COVID's been like for you, but I, I know for me, um, it, uh, it hasn't, it's been full of surprises. And like anything that's forced on you, some of these surprises I've appreciated, like a surprise birthday party. And others I have found are a little less like a surprise birthday party more like a surprise uh, pop quiz or exam. Uh, what happened for me is I had uh, three children attending YWAM. Two of them were forced home early in March. We didn't have space for them. Um, one of the reasons that I'm here now is because we finally, fi finally found space um, for them to come and live with us. But unfortunately, there are people drilling. As we have work, or work being done, there are people drilling below us, and you cannot hear me at all. And so that's why I am, again, forced to come to a coffee shop to do this here today. Um, COVID had some interesting dynamics, just even in the workforce. I was with a team of data scientists, new, young, freshly um, graduating data scientists. And we hadn't worked together as a team before. And we were forced to work together entirely on Slack and Zoom. Um, if you probably know those two communication uh, formats. Um, and of course, a little bit of email. But we found that it led to a lot of misunderstandings and miscommunication. Um, and that on the occasion when we actually got together and talked face to face, we found were completely different. It's fascinating. Um, and uh, may, I'd like you to reflect a little bit as if you haven't already, but maybe reflect a little bit, maybe more than you have, on uh, what COVID has been like for you. Um, I know for many of us listening to this, we have felt the disconnection as we moved from a three-dimensional space where we're interacting with each other to a two-dimensional space where we're seeing each other like you are seeing me right now on a screen, um, and um, uh, or even just a uh, we just hear each other via audio or via text. Um, vocationally, it's often impacted us. I know my former industry of corporate training, where we made um, money by uh, visiting workplaces and helping them with their issues, and the online world was really only for promotion, was as, as radically changed where many of my colleagues are not working nearly as much, or not working at all in some cases, due to COVID. Um, at home, of course, all of a sudden, those of us who are parents, all of a sudden, there's a whole lot of people in that home. And uh, I've spent a lot of time in coffee shops once they opened up, just to have a place to actually think um, again. Um, and um, some people have done a lot of an extension retooling. Um, I think, you know, for most of us who've been human beings on the surface for a while, we never actually thought we'd ever be in a position to actually give up three-dimensional space of relating to each other as much as we have, where I can't actually sit or meet with 
many of the people that I would normally be able to do that with. And when we do, often there's masks involved, there's six feet of distance involved, there's discussion about personal bubble, bubbles. Who, who knew ever that this could ever, ever happen? And yet, it, yet here it is, it's actually happened. And one of the great questions in all this is, did anybody know that this was coming? And of course, uh, we can find out that some people were suggesting that this was on the horizon, some scientists, economists thought that we were due for a recession and so on. Um, and uh, even some religious figures as well are saying that we knew it was coming. But on the whole, um, we didn't listen to anyone who uh, suggested that it was coming. Most of us were impre are incredibly unprepared for this. Of course, now we're looking at the question of, well, so how long is it going to last? And that we don't know. And even recently, uh, we heard that one of Johnson's and Johnson's trials, its second trial, as a matter of fact, has been canceled due to concerns about what's happening there in, in, the, in the subjects of the study. Then how to handle it, right? Given the fact that it's happened. I know in some contexts, incredibly fast, fast pivots have taken place. Um, UBCO, where I was attending, um, and within a week had everything up, all classes up online, and all interactions were happening online. Um, uh, but a longer term issue in my former profession is, do we reinvent ourselves and become an online business? Or is that marketplace already too crowded? And, a, uh, and do many of us have to find something else to do or completely do things differently? Of course, at Abbotsford Vineyard, no place to worship, which has been a key central. Abbotsford Vineyard has been known across the denomination of this country for its amazing services, production, worship, and all that's been suddenly taken away. And how do we actually deal with that? Fascinating. And sad. Absolutely sad. Um, I haven't been part of Abbotsford Vineyard, so I haven't been touched as directly. But for those of you who have, which I, I dare say is, most of you listen to this. I cannot imagine how much you have missed going to church, which is what we call the assembly of the saints, going to church and, and experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit together and experiencing life together. I've had amazing warm conversations with many of the leadership team and many of those people have told me how Abbotsford Vineyard has been known for its warmth in its community. And that that hasn't stopped, but what an incredible loss to lose that central meeting place where these things happen organically and, and, uh, uh, and you do bump into people and make connections and get to know people. And I know for me throughout my life, often the people I meet in that context have become my closest friends. And to feel that the container in which you made and formed your closest friends has been taken away from you, it's got to be incredibly, incredibly sad. I know for me, just in terms of attending church, I've felt that as well. Fascinating, then, for me to kind of look through the Bible today and find out that the Babylonian exile in particular, that's what I'll be focusing on today, that the Jewish people went through, had had, you know, thousands of years ago, had many of the same dynamics. And in case you're not familiar with or you forget what the Babylonian exile was about, this video will give you just a really quick introduction. In 586 BC, after defeating the Assyrians, a new Mesopotamian empire invades Israel. The Babylonians ransack the temple and systematically burn the sacred city. Before his eyes, the Babylonian victors slay the sons of Zedekiah, the last Davidic king, then blind him. After 400 years, Israel is wiped out. Babylonians round up the Israelite priests, prophets, and scribes and drag them in chains to Babylon. Babylonian records confirm the presence of Israelites, including the king, 
in exile. Without temple, king, or land, how can the Israelites survive? Socially, people were pulled out of the city and taken to another country. Others had to stay, and they were disconnected from each other. Um, vocationally, some were now serving the king. It was a very agrarian culture. Many people lost their land. Some people were able to get new land. Others were probably working for people. That's basically our understanding. We don't have a lot of records about the details of the economy, but for sure their economic situations were radically changed as a result of the exile. The priests no longer had a temple. What we find in the Bible is a fascinating account from Jeremiah of advice regarding how to handle this calamity that will last far longer than anyone would wish it to happen. How should they handle it? And in fact, Jeremiah records a letter that he wrote to the exiles telling them how to handle the deportation and the fact that they have been stripped of their connections and their economic situation and they're now in a new context with a new reality. And I want to just read that because it's such fascinating wisdom that has echoed throughout the millennia since then. Let's take a look at it now. Now, just before I start this, I just want to point out that in all of antiquity, there is no parallel passage. What I mean by that is, is that while all over the known world at the time, captors took over countries and peoples and deported them. That was absolutely a common practice. Nevertheless, nowhere is something like what you're about to read written regarding what those exiles should do during exile. And yet these words have resonated ever since they were written. So this is a letter that Jeremiah sent to the exiles. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have deported, not whom King Nebuchadnezzar has deported, but whom I have deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. I did this to you. This is what you should do. You should build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit. Enjoy the land that you get and can find and am given in this time. Enjoy it for as much as you can. Not only that, but settle. Take wives and fathers, sons and daughters, and take for your sons wives, and give your daughters to men that they may bear sons and daughters, and multiply there. For you must not be few. So not only should you settle, but you should make this your home. And not only should you make this your home for yourself, but also for your kids. And also multiply, prosper, grow, expand your influence here. Expand your influence here. You must not be few during these difficult times. And then this is the most radical of all. Verse 7. And seek the prosperity of the city where I have deported you. And pray on behalf of it to Yahweh. Come to me and ask for good things for it. For in its prosperity you will have prosperity. Pray for even those that would hurt you because they are now your captors and I gave you to them. And so when they do well, then you do well. This is a fantastic passage for anybody who's dealt with a bad, difficult, or dysfunctional boss or owner. When we work for them, if God has called us to do that, that's what he's called us to do. And we should pray for their success and prosperity. For when they do well, we do well. But that is not the end. It's not forever captivity. As he goes on, as soon as the time has passed, 70 years for Babylon, I will attend to you and I will fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place, to bring you back to the promised land. I will fulfill that in 70 years. For I know the plans that I am planning concerning you, declares Yahweh. 
plans for prosperity and not to harm, to give to you a future and a hope. That is actually literally an end and a hope, which means a hopeful end. I want to give you a positive end to the calamity. I want you to accept the calamity and I want you to know that the calamity is not the end game, that I have even more. I want you to prosper now and I want even more for you in the future. I want you to prosper now and I want more for you in the future. I want you to prosper now and I want more for you in the future. I know the plans I am planning concerning you, plan to give you a future and a hope, a hopeful end. And then when you call me and you come and you pray to me, then I will listen to you. We will have conversations It will be back and forth. It will be easier. I will say, yes, things will come. I am planning for this. I have not forgotten you. And yes, this is hard. And yes, I seem distant. And yes, I seem uncaring. I get that. I warned you this would happen, but I am coming. When you search for me, then you will find me, if you seek me with all your heart. And I will let myself be found by you, declares Yahweh, and I will restore your fortunes. I will restore the promise I gave you. And so, here Yahweh says, yes, it's a bad time. Yes, this is not the best. Yes, I want you to settle. But no, this is not all that I have for you. And if you wait, I will give you still more. So in the book of Daniel, we see this kind of advice being lived out in the first deportation to Babylon of Jews. Um, we see Daniel and his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego um, being selected to uh, learn the language and the history uh, of the Babylonians, and in fact take on Babylonian names and wear Babylonian clothing. They do this willingly. They just settle in. And they accept that this is what is going on for them now, and they embrace it and they try to prosper within it. However, of course, the book of Daniel is also notable in that Daniel in particular continues to pray even though it is against the culture. Uh, his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego continue to insist on allegiance to God only and not to any other gods or um, religious institutions. Daniel and his friends maintain physical purity by refusing to defile themselves in ways that uh, might have been attractive, maybe might have made them look a little bit more like they, sh they would fit in, but they will not defile themselves, even though they would wear the clothing and take on the names. And it's really interesting because the Encyclopedia Britannica's summation of this time in exile reads a little bit like this. I'm going to paraphrase it. There was so much hope that the Jewish people had during this time that they would return to their homeland. As Jeremiah had promised and other prophets did as well, they actually became quite attracted, attractive and began to attract a number of adherents from other cultures that ran into in Babylon to their faith as well as people started to see something in these people uh, that gave them hope as well. Isn't that sort of what you want in your life? Is, is you want to have a kind of a clarity about who you are and what you're doing and, and, and what God made you to do that actually it pulls others along to also live up the clarity about who God made them to be. Today, the Jewish culture lives on its own identity and, and, and Jewish people have adopted the suggestions of Jeremiah, wherever they've been, they've settled in, they've multiplied, they've continued to pray. Um, not all of them, of course, but many have continued to pray. Uh, many have continued to maintain purity. And many of them can have, have continued to pray for the prosperity of the country that they're in, even knowing um, that their prosperity is linked to it. Many Jewish festivals still include prayer for prosperity of the country that the, the people 
in participating in those festivals are actually in during that time. And today, um, there is still a Jewish people. There isn't really a Babylonian people. Um, there uh, isn't really a Philistine, a Philistinian people. I think that would be the word. But there is a Jewish people. This way of being, despite hard times, despite significant setbacks, has maintained the identity and the sense of purpose of these people throughout the centuries to follow, as they've continued to follow the advice of Jeremiah and the observances of Daniel. So we'll just chill out for a moment and think a little bit about how we might apply what Jeremiah said to the exiles and what Daniel did in the exile to our time in COVID. We'll start just thinking about you. So when you think about yourself, we've all been hating these times, most of us. Is there a way in which you need to stop hating it? I mean, not that it's going to become any better if you do, but is there a way in which it would just be more helpful if you could just accept that COVID is happening and all the restrictions are in place? And I know that different people respond differently to all the restrictions, but can you just accept that that is all going on? All of those dynamics around the restrictions. Can you think about what you can do to just personally prosper in this time? Spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, physically. What can you do to best prosper in this time? What spiritual practices do you need to maintain? Especially because this is all going on. But are there advantages to COVID that now you're going to be able to spend a little extra time doing something that has nourished you in the past? Are you having more difficulty maintaining purity during this time? Is there something you need to do about that? Somebody you need to talk to? Do you need to Hold yourself more accountable to what's going on. Do you need to actually just do things, set yourself up for success better so you're more pure? And can you pray for the prosperity of your country and your community and the people around you? We could do the same thing for family, and you will just very quickly now. Are there people in your family who you need to make it easier on, help them accept the reality. Um, ways that you can help them prosper and do well. Can you encourage them and enable them, give them time to do spiritual practices? Does it make sense to check in on other family members' purity? Can you ask beautiful, clear questions about how everyone's doing? And can you pray for the prosperity of your country together and of course, each other's prosperity as well. Are there things you need to do at work to more accept the reality of what's going on? Are there things you can do to prosper in these times? You probably have some spiritual practices you have in your personal life. Some of you do them at the workplace. This is an encouragement to keep on doing that. Some workplaces, it's possible to actually pray together. Maybe now it makes more, more sense than ever to do that. In some workplaces, when things get tough, it's tempting to cheat. I want to encourage you to maintain your integrity and your purity in terms of how you conduct your business in this time. And can you pray for the prosperity of your country as well, in your workplace and as part of your work? Finally, in this church, I think it makes sense to talk about that too. This is the reality at Abbotsford Vineyard right now. Are there things you can do to settle in and accept that in terms of how you relate to your uh, brothers and sisters? Are there things you can do to multiply, to kind of keep on connecting 
during this time. There are special ways that you can, you can reach out, text to each other, email, those kinds of things. Are you able to maintain spiritual practices together? Are there ways you can do that? Meeting people for coffee, having people over as much as is healthy and as much as you're able to given your COVID restrictions. Can you, can you connect and pray together? Of course, maintaining purity is usually a personal thing, but sometimes it does make sense to ask brothers and sisters about their purity and how they're doing especially if you have those kinds of relationships. And I would encourage you to have those kinds of relationships with a couple of brothers or sisters, same gender, at church. And here maybe we'll insert, pray for the prosperity of the church at this difficult time. Does it make sense to do that as well? Thank you so much for your time today. I pray that God will continue to bless you in every way as you seek his will in your life, in the life of your family, in the life of this church, and in the busyness of your work.